Welcome to Conversations in Education. I am your host, Dr. Leslie Torres Rodriguez, Superintendent of Hartford Public Schools. Today we present part four of our series, Great Schools for All Students, a four-part series about school district redesign in Hartford. Hartford is redesigning its school district and our series delves into the most crucial guiding principles behind the district models that I presented to the Board of Education for their vote in January. The changes that will be made in our district impact every family and student, our teachers and school staff, our community partners, and our neighborhoods. The guiding principles around which we are redesigning the district include great teaching and learning in every school, expanded family and community partnerships, safe and equitable access to great schools and pathways, and fiscal sustainability. Fiscal sustainability means that we utilize all of our resources, our time, our money, our people, efficiently and responsibly. We are living in tough budgetary times due to flat and diminished federal, state, and city, and even grant funding. Our school buildings are at 62% of their capacity. When our district is restructured, according to my plan, our buildings will be at 84% capacity. Students will have more supports, more people to guide, teach, and care for them. They will enjoy more of the equitable resources that they deserve. We are not just making changes in our facilities and our grade structures. We are making financial, budgetary, and even curricular changes so that we can ensure excellent supports for all of our students, not just for today, but for the next decade and way beyond into our future. The need that we have is dire. We do not have the luxury of being complacent. We need to make smart choices now. To discuss all of this, I welcome our guests today, Joanna LaSalle, Hartford Public Schools Executive Director of Financial Management, Chris Woods, Executive Director of Curriculum, Instruction, and Media Literacy at Hartford Public Schools, and joining us today by phone is David Rosenberg. David is a partner at Education Resource Strategies, the organization that just completed a comprehensive study of our school district, which informed our restructuring work. I welcome you all today. Thank, Thank you. you. And Joanna, I'm actually going to begin by um, asking you um, a question, given that, you know, as Executive Director of Financial Management, you are in charge with understanding our district budget, how it is that, you know, the financial changes that we make are going to impact the future, um, and you also um, understand how our budget depends so much on the changes that are made at the federal, at the state, and even at the city level. And knowing that um, only 22% of our district budget comes from our taxpayers, how is it that you foresee uh, the future of our, of our budget, right, based on all of these external forces that are, that are at play? Well, the external forces have always been at play. So how I foresee it is we just have to continually um, keep up with those changes at the federal level, the state level, the local level, at the same time as implement, like you said, the district model of excellence. So redesigning our schools will help us meet those challenging changes that we're faced with based on you know decreased funding at the federal level, the state level, and local level. So as those funds decrease, that doesn't mean that we need to compromise our educational, um, what we give to our students, our educational settings. We just need to be ahead of it and try to combat it with the wonderful changes that are being implemented and suggested. So when you're talking about compromising it, and, I, and, and that's so important for us to, to, to really commit to the fact that we're not compromising what it is that we're committing to. But at the same time, um, when I think about the diminished resources, I think about the resources that we have all around us in terms of our community-based community resources. So how do you um, think that our community partnerships and even, even our grants uh, improve our financial forecast? That's a difficult question. I will have to say that our grants do not improve our financial forecast because our grants are restricted and unrestricted. So depending on where they come from, and then we have to follow the model or the grantor's you know, recommendation as to how to spend those funds. So in the example, you can get a grant to you know, revitalize a school building. That's a one-time source that does not lend to improving curriculum. So you 
you have to really be careful when you speak about grants. Some of the federal entitlements help to improve um, curriculum and things such as that. So look into grants as a source to fix the district. I don't consider that a good model. I consider looking to restructure the system as a better model. And then and with regard to um, our community partnerships, right? I, we just heard you talk about the fact that grants, um, you know, and, and we can't count on the grants, right, for, forever. I know we've had that conversation before. But as it relates to our community partnerships, how do they um, help us, right, mitigate some of these challenges that we have? I believe based on the, um, their, their connections to the families in the city of Harford, helps us, you know, restructure the district. When we're listening to our stakeholders, when we're hearing directly from them what they see as the needs in the community, I think it helps inform our process because they have those closer, not so much closer connections, but close connections with families because they're working with them day to day through that the programs that they're implemented. Now, as they see their resources change, then we have to try to partner together to look for additional resources or partner together to see how we may restructure even our resources that may lend to help out our community partners. Mm -hmm. So then clearly it's a collaborative effort, which we know we heard um, as one of the recurring themes when we engage the community. Right? How is it that we're going to expand the resources and the partnerships? Um, when we're thinking about guaranteeing, right, or this compromise that, that we don't want to make because we know that we want to stay focused and committed to doing the very best, right, for all of our students um, and, and guarantee that we provide that rigorous instruction um, that our students have the skills and the knowledge, uh, the voice, uh, the social emotional supports that they need uh, so that they can thrive not only you know when they're in school but beyond school um, what changes in how we currently allocate our resources in this case right our, our money um, are being made then as we think about restructuring what what will that look like I think it's part of the district model of excellence redesign plan so when we're getting ready to step into the phase of implementation you're talking about the school designs that's going into um, redesigning our or rethinking about our district so as we use that method and that model we're going to use those strategies that we talk about during our during the meetings so as we um, as we redesign our schools under the district model of excellence mm -hmm. I believe that that's where we're going to factor in, as you said, the social emotional needs of our students and things such as that, because then that's going to lead us to a comprehensive plan that we can continue to utilize year to year, year to year, as you said, and grow us into the future. Mm -hmm. So that gets into um, your work, right, Chris, and mm -hmm. the fact that we're now shifting to um, not only the transition team, but also the school design team. And so in your role, um, Chris, as Executive Director of Curriculum Instruction and Media Literacy, mm -hmm. can you describe um, not only what you do, but um, tell us about some of the changes that you and your team um, are implementing in curriculum and instruction as, as part of this design and the restructuring process? Sure. So I supervise uh, our curriculum and instruction for the district. So what that means is our curriculum department is the lead on uh, implementing our curriculum and supporting our schools and instruction. So for our English language arts, which is our reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills, for mathematics, for STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, as well as arts and all the disciplines of the arts, uh, music and theater, drama and visual arts, okay. and then also uh, technology. And I, in particular, also support our school libraries. Mm -hmm. And as you were saying with community partners, our partnership with Hartford Public Library in, yes. for Boundless. Um, and then we also have wellness, so our PE and our health as well. So it's really the core curriculum, what you expect a student to really graduate with as a core base of knowledge. So what we have been doing is working toward common curriculum throughout the district. So as a result of past reforms in portfolio district model, a lot of that work uh, was done at school. So we had different schools in different places uh, with curriculum and with instruction. And with the, um, the new model of excellence, 
we will be able to really implement common curriculum across the district, but schools take that and provide their own flavor to it um, according to the students that are in front of them for the individual teachers. So we act in direct support of our schools, helping our principals, our coaches, and our teachers, and then ultimately our students um, with curriculum. And then another piece that we've been working into now that we do have uh, curriculum in place is assessment. Mm. So that's where we can tell what the students are able to do um, and know from the standards and we are able to utilize an online assessment system to be able to really take a look at that data and dive deep into it to see what standard is it that we're having trouble with and not just, oh, you have a D and I don't really know why. Mm -hmm. So um, using data analysis, we're able to really dig deep into that. And then another big piece of our work is the professional learning in the district for our teachers. So with the uh, new district model for excellence, we are going to be able to work in a, a more embedded way with professional learning. Because of the way the schools will be structured, it's going to allow us to create small learning communities between schools and then networks so that teachers can really learn from teachers in smaller uh, groups and studies show or research shows that that's the best way adults mm -hmm. learn. Um, so it could, because it's important for our teachers to have common language around what they're doing in the classroom and our curriculum. Um, some other things related to the data, we're working on standards-based grading in our lower grades. So again, going back to what, is, what standards have I mastered and what ones do I still need to work on as a student. And that rolls into uh, that professional learning structure. And then another piece of our work is innovation. So we've been working several, for several years now in many of our high schools as centers of innovation, testing out uh, what does it mean to do blended learning? What is mastery-based learning? What is project-based learning? And we we're able to take that learning and then move forward as a district to scale that up so we can spread uh, that innovation across the district. And then really in general, a lot of the work I do personally um, is strategic planning around all these different pieces that go into curriculum and instruction in the district. So all of those pieces um, right now have to be re-examined from the mm -hmm. lens of the district model of excellence, which I know you, you've been doing. Yeah. But how then is the restructuring allowing for smarter use, right? Mm -hmm. More efficient use of of the placement of, of the people because our people are our resource as well mm -hmm. um, who provide the supports to our students. Right. So with the new model for excellence, we will able we will be able to have more flexibility. I believe in our staffing because as we consolidate some schools and, and shift some students in different schools, that's going to provide additional classes in each grade level. So by having the different classes or more classes in each grade level, that in turn provides us with flexibility because it frees up resources, meaning people, to have more electives offered. So right now in some schools there might be PE there might be art and that might be it. But with the new redesign, we can expand those options and add in maybe a technology class or art and music. Uh, so by doing the restructuring, it frees up and provides more flexibility for staffing to be able to provide more resources for our, our different um, areas of learning. And then particularly uh, adding in the middle grades mm -hmm. model is going to be phenomenal because one of the issues we have right now in our middle grades in the K-8 model is that our grade 6-8 class sizes are so small, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, yes. our, our capacity that we have filled. And what happens because we have small cohorts of students in middle grades is there are four teachers for all three grade levels. So what that means is if I am the English language art, art, arts teacher in that school, I'm teaching sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, all three grade levels. Um, it works, you know, our teachers yeah. are phenomenal at being able to handle that. But a more efficient model is to use the middle grades model, where you have a team of teachers, so you have those four core areas 
I'm an English language arts, a math, a social studies, and a science teacher. They work with the same group of students, approximately 100 students, and the students have the opportunity to actually mix and mingle throughout the day, which is very important for our adolescent learners to have that um, varied social interaction. So what happens right now is they travel as a homeroom all day long, so they don't get that experience of the true middle school model. And then uh, another piece, big piece of middle school is the idea of being able to explore different options. So having a career exploration class, a technology class, or chorus, or band. So going to the middle school model where we will have um, more efficient use of resources, we will be able to offer these different um, areas of, of learning for our students. So that type of design, Chris, that you're speaking to, um, you know, we have to identify how is it that we at the district level, right, are funding mm -hmm. um, our, our schools, right, to identifying the resources. And so, you know, I'm going to ask David now with regard to the current system that, that we have, right, which allocates funds uh, to schools based on the student-based budgeting model where each uh, student has, has a pool of funds, if you will, that follow the student um, throughout their education here in Hartford. And so, David, you have spent several years um, studying urban districts like, like ours, right? So Boston and, and Baltimore, guiding those uh, systems through transitions. And you've just spent actually several months with us here um, studying our district. Can you share with us what your um, knowledge is and, and what you think the pros and the cons are around student-based budgeting that you've learned throughout the years and, and your work nationally? Sure. Yeah, at ERS, we've uh, we've had the, the opportunity to work with leaders like yourselves in many districts, including in Hartford, um, around issues related to equity. Um, and I think that's really where the conversation around student-based budgeting starts, right? So a, a district that is, is using its reorganizing resources well is doing so because this, those dollars are distributed equitably, which means in line with student need. There's transparency, you know where the dollars are going, it's very clear to everybody. And there's some flexibility about exactly what happens at schools within the context of the district strategy. And so student-based budgeting is one way to solve for those things because you have a very clear formula about why dollars go where they do, that's transparency. Um, you can align the dollars to the needs of students uh, based on wherever the district's priorities are, that's equity. And then ideally, in most districts, what you do is you create flexibility where principals, because instead of getting a staff assignment or a program assignment, they get a set of dollars and a set of parameters and make decisions about how they want to use those resources. So that means that student-based budgeting is really helpful in some districts and less so in others. So to, to address your question about sort of pros and cons, you know, in a district where um, where you have a school, where your equity issues are about um, the decisions made about how to organize resources, right, that are solvable via changing a formula, this is kind of a neat strategy, right? In a district where you have inequity and it's due to, for example, having some very small schools, which, you know, on a per pupil basis cost more to operate. Um, Student-based budgeting isn't going to solve your small schools challenge. <laughs> it's, it's going to surface it. Uh, you know, in a district where um, you know all of your highest-paid teachers are concentrated in certain schools, student-based budgeting is not going to solve your equity problem. You have to figure out how to how to move teachers yeah. around the district more equitably. Um, and similarly, student-based budgeting is really helpful when it's paired with that flexibility, and the principals are getting support from the district and from their teams to make strategic decisions about how they organize their schools. So it's a it's a neat strategy. Um, it's you know, it's, it's increasingly popular. It's definitely the kind of thing that you want to focus on as part of a broader strategy around some of the issues that Chris was just describing around what's actually happening in schools and is it a thing that you can do to enable those changes or is it, you know, a set of technical changes um, that, you know, may be indirectly related, in which case it's, you know, not the right way to invest your, your leadership mm -hmm. time. And so, you know, David, you, you know our context, right? You know that when we look at our peer districts, we have highest English learner um, population, highest special education um, population, certainly 
have a high um, concentration of students in, in, in poverty. And so as we restructure this, our, our, our model, what other considerations should we be thinking about um, relative to the specific needs that we have in our district? Yeah, I would say two things about that. One is that, you know, we always we always with our district partners encourage them to be strategic and intentional about the decisions they make. And there are some decisions that are non strategic and importantly not intentional. Right? No one in Hartford intended for enrollment to decline, particularly in the middle grades, to a point where your middle schools face the challenges that Chris just described. Right. That was neither strategic nor intentional. So, and this is, you know, you're operating within that context. So the first, the first sort of guide, guideline here is make decisions that with, about the dollars that are in line with the strategy so clearly outlined and have, have goals associated with them. And then I would point to some of the issues that are in the guiding principles that you've defined, the non-negotiables that you've defined. And Chris talked about some of these as well, right? So uh, if we believe that uh, we and we know we have a large base of relatively early career teachers and early early career principals, and we need to invest more in professional growth and support and ongoing teaming and collaboration and curriculum support so that we ensure that kids are being taught with rigor and, uh, and quality across the board. That's an investment that the district's going to want to make. Similarly, if you know we've said, look, let's let's make a uh, ensure we have a strong middle grades experience for kids in the shift to middle school. So it would be easy to say, oh, we have bigger, bigger middle schools and bigger middle grades. We shouldn't spend as much money there. That may be the case, but the reality is that there's some pretty specific things you probably want to do to make sure the fifth to sixth grade transition is smooth. To make sure that um, the kids are, are are learning quickly in sixth grade and moving on that path towards high school. Um, and starting to think about the high school decisions that they have uh, ahead of them. So it really flows out of the district strategy uh, and just ensuring that there's real clarity around the decisions that you're making and you know, those investments are intentional uh, and it'll get you where you're trying to go. And, and one way I see, uh, David, to get at that clarity um, and that intentionality is also to leverage to leverage our data, right? And so. When I think about um, student data, you know, Joanna, one, one question I have is, how is it that we can use student data to guide those financial choices, right? What it is that David is talking about, right? You have to determine how it is that we're going to uh, make the strategy, if you will, right, come alive and then resource it. And so um, when we think about appropriating, you know, our, our funds and our resources in our schools, how is it that you can describe how to split up a pie that already, right, isn't enough um, from the get-go? Um, how do we make sure in, in our restructuring that um, we tend to, to the needs of everyone? I think what David said is about the strategic plan that you're putting in place and you have to make sure that you put resources um, to follow that plan. So whereas um, what Chris was talking about, the um, program improvements or the professional development that our teachers so need, um, when we develop the budget, we make sure that there's a dollar amount shown that will support that professional development. Um, without that dollar amount there, then the, the, professional, the professional development then goes away and then we're still trying to, you know, dig ourselves out of that particular need that we have. So with the district model of excellence and us consolidating schools and, and closing some schools, that then allows us to take those resources and reallocate them for the needs that we see that our, not only our students have, but our teachers and our support staff have. So we don't want to, you know, exclude anyone. We want, uh, we want to say that we're supporting all, not just some. So even though our teachers see our students the most, they still see the principal, they still see the custodian, they still see that secretary. So we want to improve each and every person's skills in our buildings. So we just have to make sure that we use the resources that we have strategically and to the best of our ability to make sure that we can meet the strategic operating plan. As well. And in that plan is the needs of those students. So, so when you I'm, think about a, a district-wide, right, um, support, so a, a model of supports, not just 
um, for the students, but at all levels of the organization. And so when we think about um, how this comes comes to life programmatically, Chris, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we think about the creation of, of pathways for students so that they can have clear pathways from elementary to middle to high school mm -hmm. um, in our neighborhood schools. And so what changes then are taking place um, in academics and curriculum so that all of our students can excel as they transition? And, um, you know, David talked about the strategy and making sure that we also monitor the strategy. Can you also mm -hmm. speak to us what about about those benchmarks? Because at the end of the day, right, that's what we are investing and reinvesting and repurposing mm -hmm. um, the potential savings in. Right, and also just to tie into what Joanna was saying, uh, when it comes to teaching and learning, it's the adult actions that determine student outcomes. So by having those supports for professional learning is a direct impact on our students. And as far as um, creating the pathways and some changes, like I mentioned earlier, we're working toward a common curriculum. So, um, but it can get modified at the school level. And even this morning, I used the analogy of we're all using the same ice cream cone, but we're each using different flavors of ice cream at the school level. But what happens when that is in place is, as we know in our district, our kids move around a lot. So they move, you know, they're in one school at one point in the year and maybe they leave the area and then they come back and they're in a different school. So by having a common curriculum, what that does is it, it means that in September to October, if you're in third grade, no matter what school you're in in the district, you're learning about the same common items in the curriculum. So if I do move from one school to another, I'm not missing a chunk of learning. I'm on the same track. So within the same year, that's how that works for pacing. Um, the way the pathways come into play is by having the common curriculum, when I go on to sixth grade at the middle school next year, you know, I'm in fifth grade now, that sixth grade teacher can be confident in what I learned in fifth grade to be able to build on what I have learned now that I'm in sixth grade. So that's what we call vertical alignment, that going grade to grade, you're guaranteed certain learning experiences that the next grade level teacher understands this is where you are in your learning and let's build and move further with you. So that's the importance of that common curriculum and the transitions. But what also happens um, with that and the professional learning is we're all speaking the same, fi same language as teachers in the district. You know, what that standard means to you at your school, it means the same thing to me at my school. And that's where that small community professional learning can come into play, that all our, our adults in the district are on the same page of where our students need to be. And then another exciting part of our um, district model for excellence is bringing in the whole student framework. So this is looking at the whole student holistically, um, not just you know, how they're functioning at, you know, physically in PE, but how are they functioning academically in their classes? How are they functioning just as a person? Do I know what to do if I'm in a situation that might escalate? You know, do I have the skills? to diffuse that in some way and walk away. Um, so we call that our whole student framework. It's in development, but eventually what the, one of the goals is, is that we will be aligning the components of the whole student framework to our curriculum. So that's based on equity, on cultural responsiveness, um, building community, community building experiences, health and wellness, um, so all those pieces will come together within our curriculum. And then as far as measuring, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we're working toward common assessments and we're using that uh, online assessment tool to really look at our data and see where our students are. But then that even goes higher in that our district have what we call KPIs, Key Performance Indicators, that we measure uh, throughout the year as year-long goals and those are set in different buckets so there's an academic bucket where are we with math and with English, English language arts where are we with our chronic absenteeism where are we with discipline um, because that is the whole child 
So by monitoring our KPIs throughout the year, that gives us those benchmarks of are we on track, what do we need to work on um, for the next quarter to really move us ahead to where we need to be. And, and I think also those KPIs are, are um, going to help us determine what additional professional learning, mm -hmm. right, our staff might need, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about creating a culture of learning, not just for our students, but for, for, for the adults in the organization and the district. And so as we think about the potential reinvestment that we may have, um, you know, the KPIs will, will help us guide mm -hmm. those conversations. And the, the question that I have for David is around um, the opportunity that might exist for us when we think about our district model of excellence and the potential to, to reinvest about $15 million per year. And so how, how is it that um, we arrived at that figure, uh, David, and, and then speak to the opportunities that you believe now we may have based on some of those efficiencies? Yeah, and I want to preface this by saying capturing and repurposing savings when you're when you're closing schools or consolidating schools is something that many districts struggle with. And I think the situation we have in Hartford is one that sets you up really well um, to be able to repurpose dollars. So of the $15 million that's projected, $4 million comes straight off of uh, costs the district pays to operate facilities that it won't be operating anymore. And in many of those cases, those are leased facilities, right? So literally, the district paying to occupy someone someone else's facility, and those costs go away when the leases go away. Um, so that's $4 million of it. And then the, 11, the remaining $11 million comes from the fact that as, we, as we've had declining enrollment and, and the small middle grades in particular, but across all schools that, that, that we've been describing and that Chris described before, you end up with very, very small classes, far below what the district and the state have said is the goal for what is appropriate to serve certain students. So if you can bring you know, a, a school, the students together under one roof to more schools, the math dictates that you actually don't have as many uh, teachers required just to do the basics in the school of having those classrooms. So that's just about moving your staffing ratios closer to your targets um, versus what you have before. Now, your, your, the key question is, so what do we do with that? Um, because that was an investment, right? Those are money, that's money the district was spent. And so that, I think, comes back to your strategic plan and some of the issues that uh, Chris was describing. So I think there's some really interesting work and decisions to be made about, well, how are you going to implement really high quality professional learning and professional growth structures for teachers. Does that involve coaches? Does it involve teacher leadership roles? Does it involve um, uh, uh, sort of reduced staffing loads for your novice teachers? There's all kinds of things that we're seeing around the country that could be possible there. Um, similarly, when you think about middle grades or transition grades, you know, one of the things that we know works well to differentiate instruction and really support kids, particularly in sixth and ninth grade could involve re, you know, potentially a really um, reduced uh, uh, student-teacher ratio in the transition grades. So you provide a really deep focus for kids and really support your social-emotional strategy. The thing we say, we say and hear from districts all the time is you can do anything, but you can't do everything. Mm -hmm. And so really the question is, you know, what are the moves you want to make that are the best use of the dollars that you do have? in the schools and then to the point that Joanna and Chris were making earlier is how do you ensure that you're holding yourself accountable, ensure you're very clear about investments that you're making even when they're implicit investments that you maybe didn't intend they are just happening along the way, like some of what we saw with the very small schools over the last several years. Um, and track that and make sure that you're getting what you need and if you know, all the pieces come together, student performance really starts to shift. And that of course is the ultimate goal. That certainly is the ultimate goal, right? Making sure that we develop um and, and continue to sustain uh, a district that meets the needs of all of our students. And so I want to thank you, um, all three of you, for um, your passionate um, description of not only the district model of excellence, but how each of you um, have certainly contributed to, to really the development, this collaborative process that we engage to come at, you know, um, and arrive at the district model of excellence, the guiding principles, um, and the non-negotiables that were informed by so many, so many voices. So um, I wanna thank our guests for being with us today. 
um, I urge you to participate in restructuring our school district by visiting our website at hartfordschools.org so that you can learn about the events that you can attend as we shift to transitions and school design um, phases. Uh, thank you for watching and stay tuned for more conversations in education.